God. I may be poor, but I am somebody. Red and yellow, brown, black, and white. We're all precious in God's sight. Everybody, somebody. Stop the violence. Save the children. Stop bullying. Save the children. Pull your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Hi, I'm Dr. Sonia Whitaker, National Education Policy Director for Push for Excellence. And on behalf of the Rainbow Push Coalition, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us on our Saturday morning forum. We want to thank Word Network for bringing you to us and us to you. And yet at the same time, we recognize that there are many of you who are watching us right now on Facebook Live. If you're doing so, we'd like you to pause for just a moment and like our page. And for those of you who prefer to watch us on YouTube Live, we say hello to you too. We want to ask that you subscribe to our page so that you can gain immediate access to all of the content that we have in store for you. And speaking of content, we need your support. We just can't do it without you. And we've made it really easy for you to give. You can simply take that cell phone of yours and hold it to the QR code on the screen and give right on the spot. And if you prefer, you can take that same cell phone and simply text the word PUSH to 41444. Text PUSH to 41444. Or you may go directly to our website, rainbowpush.org, and simply click on the donate button. But whatever you do, we have a lot in store for you today. Do not touch that dial. The PUSH is on. We're celebrating the legend himself, that prophetic icon, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, the game-changing gospel giant and prophetic witness. Happy birthday. How can we celebrate this in a way that truly reflects appreciation for the man, the mission, the message, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr.? I want to invite you to help us bring to pass a vision that was given to him by the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King had a dream of 1,000 churches connected. We got, what, 50 major markets. If we have 20 churches in those 50 major markets, that would basically say, I'm going to connect with Rainbow Push. And in connecting with Rainbow Push, we'll do it on several levels. We'll do it by way of offering our financial support to Rainbow Push. I've already sent a check both to Reverend Jackson and to Rainbow Push because it's definitely necessary at this time that we understand the need to utilize our prophetic witness in an empowered fashion. I often say that while the Republicans are playing a game of power chess, the Democrats are trying to learn how to play checkers. Listen, we preach about power. We talk about power. The question is, are we going to wield power? Reverend Jackson says we can wield power with 1,000 churches around this country connected, connected in investing in Rainbow Push, but also not only must we invest in Rainbow Push, I hope you join me and will contribute at least $1,000. I've done more than that, but you can do what God has blessed you to do. And then not only that, I want to encourage you as Reverend Jackson is talking about, we need, just as we have Sunday school classes, we've got to have social justice classes and teach what it means to unite or reunite in holy wedlock what never should have been divorced, Jesus and justice. That's what 1,000 churches connected can do. Imagine 1,000 churches throughout this country connected, wielding power, watch this, as one, but at the same time doing doing all we can to make a difference in our respective air areas, being fed, watch this, information, as well as inspiration from Rainbow Push as a family and Reverend Jesse Jackson as our fearless leader. So I hope that you'll join me. 
Join 1000 Churches Connected. That's a real good way to say happy birthday, Reverend Jackson. God bless you. Keep hope alive. Hello, I'm Robert Patillo, and I'm the executive director of the Rainbow Post Coalition Peachtree Street Project here in Atlanta, Georgia. I would like to invite you to this year's 23rd Annual Creating Opportunity Conference, which will be held October 19th through 21st at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Atlanta. This year, we will be embracing the change in an unstable global economy. Uh, we'll be having sessions on everything from political leadership to elections to women's uh, to a women's roundtable, international discussions on social economic issues that exist around the globe. The first two days, you'll be able to log in and view the conference from anywhere in the world. For more information, go to rainbowpush.org or email myself, rpatillo, at rainbowpush.org or our program director, Trina Heathington, at theathington at rainbowpush.org. And as Reverend Jackson would say, make sure that you keep hope alive. Without further delay, one of the most iconic figures in black history who single-handedly registered more voters than any living human being. That's right. I want you to put your hands together for Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. Yeah. We intend to register millions of voters in this That's drive. right. 18 for the tour going across the nation. We face an unusual combination of too much street violence it's, un it's un underserved by the balance in our nation's capital. Oh. You quickly learn the fire and the passion that's necessary, and it's a fire and passion that's necessary for this moment. Yes. For this moment. So when you talk about this is intersectionality, you talk about what Kim Crenshaw said. <laughs> so when you talk about, say her name, when she looked out and realized people were talking about folks being killed by police, we were only talking about men. When women were being killed, she said, we gotta say her name. So I am happy and honored that what's new in this tour is that we are unbanning books. We're gonna give away over 6,000 books. Woo! Yeah. Worth over a hundred plus thousand dollars. And we want you to really know that this is what democracy looks like. The work of Jesse Lewis Jackson here at the Dr. King's workshop is undaunted and cannot be stopped and will not fail at our ultimate goal of creating a more perfect union. And so as we have in every city that we're going to hit, we're ready to get on the bus. All right. This is Bishop Tavis Grant, the Acting National Executive Director of the Rainbow Push Coalition, and this is State of the Movement. They arrive in a motorcade with busloads of voters. Their objective, to make their voices heard. Their means, the ballot box. You need to show up at the ballot box. You need to make sure that your voice is heard and that legislators know that not only you are concerned about your communities, but you're concerned about how they vote. The group of primarily African-American voters is hoping to spread the word and get voters to the polls with an emphasis on early voting. The so-called super site in the loop is filled with dozens of voting booths that can accommodate a huge crowd like this. We want every vote to count. That's what this tour is about. It's about galvanizing, mobilizing, uh, and really bringing the collective of community back to not just restore democracy, uh, but make sure democracy is available to everybody. In addition to Rainbow Push Coalition members in Chicago, the buses are part of a national voter traveling across the country. 
They're also working to register as many new voters as possible. These are communities that usually feel nobody cares about them. They don't, they think people don't care if they vote. So they are happy to see somebody coming and saying, you count, we want you to vote. The tour is stopping in at least 25 cities this month in advance of Election Day on November 8th. We're here doing early voting now. So we're going to do early voting, we're going to vote by mail, we're going to go house to house and block to block. You know, the work and legacy of Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson is so very critical and relevant today. We thank you for your partnership, your engagement, and your contribution to this incredible movement called Rainbow Push Coalition. You know, as we go into midterms 2022, the critical and uh, important imperative to not only register, not only be mobilized, not only be galvanized, but to turn out in numbers, record numbers, to reclaim the fabric of our democracy is our responsibility and our obligation. For example, polling suggests to us that in, in, in Georgia, for example, 50% of the Democratic vote was African American, while the population in the state is 33%. Look in Michigan, for example, 20% of the vote was African American and 14% of the state is black. Or in Pennsylvania, 21% of the vote was African American, but the population is only 12%. It's a critical aspect, and these dynamics and dimensions that are facing us require decisions that we must make for our own best interest. 55 million Americans are unregistered. There's some 18 million returning citizens, those who have facilitated all the requirements related to their incarceration, have no idea that they are too eligible to vote. And in that 55 million, 10 million African Americans are unregistered. That's why this week, Reverend Jackson and Ben Chavis and attorney Barbara Arnwine and La Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright, Black Voters Matter, NNPA, Transformative Justice Coalition, and the Rainbow Coalition, we started a 14-state, 25-city tour in Minneapolis. It came through Chicago, went through Pennsylvania, and it's on its way to Florida to make sure that we put it on the line that this is our time and this is our turn. On the ballot this time is employment, wages, and the right to organize. For example, during COVID-19, the pandemic, it hit Chicago hard, it hit New York hard, it hit Pennsylvania hard, it hit hard all over the country. And yet here in Chicago, 72% of the city's death toll was African-Americans, while African-Americans are only 30% of the city's population. And then there are those who are trying to weaponize. They're using class polarization. They're using race polarization. They're using gender polarization in producing and creating a cultural civil war. At least seven states have enacted 10 laws to make it more difficult to vote. And of those 10 states, five of them have laws that make it hard to early vote and mail-in vote. For example, in Arizona, they have an amendment now that makes it possible for you to challenge the election under the most frivolous terms of any means, any place, anywhere. At least seven states have enacted inter election interference laws, which afford individuals to go into state court and challenge the counting of the Secretary of State. This legislation of election interference in at least 12 states have enacted 19 laws to make sure that they can suppress, they can suffocate, and cause the election to be subjected to those who support insurrection, sedition, and voter suppression. People of color have consistently 
been at the whim and at, and at the peril of those who want to make sure that we do not have free and fair elections by making you wait longer, by closing polling places early, by making it difficult to prove your ID, even your birth. And yet today, nearly a half a million black businesses have taken the hardest hit since the pandemic, a 41% plunge in the black American economy. Let me tell you something. We can do something about it. We can be mobilized, we can be galvanized, and we organize to make sure that these midterm elections, your voice is heard, and there's no greater voice than that of the voter. You know, one of the things I've learned from Reverend Jesse Jackson, and that is the highest seat of our nation is not that of the president, it is that of the citizen who bears the responsibility and the obligation to vote. And so I want to encourage you to join the fastest growing civil rights movement in America, the Rainbow Push Coalition. I want you to join Reverend Jesse Jackson in our quest to make this a more perfect union. And you can do it by first making sure you register to vote. You can go to any number of sites, including ours, www.rainbowpush.org, and you can check your status and make sure that you are eligible to vote. And then make sure you use the tools that we're going to provide from state to state, county to county, where you can make sure you can be a defender of our democracy. And as a defender of our democracy, you then take your rightful place in helping Jesse Jackson keep hope alive. This is State of the Movement. We've heard 16 other people so far address this crowd of about 2,500 very partisan people. They are the members of what Jesse Jackson calls his Rainbow Coalition. It is not just blacks, it is women. He has pledged to have a woman run with him as vice president. It's Hispanics, the Freeze Movement, it's Indians, the National Farmers Alliance. It is Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition. When he was running for president, he changed the rules in the Democratic Party. They were no longer winner take off. Not only that, he registered millions of people to vote and enfranchised them throughout the South. It was called Run Jesse Run. Nothing's gonna stop you, Jesse. Don't let nothing turn you around. Run, Jesse, run. He formulated what he called a rainbow coalition of the dispossessed. That was African Americans, Latinos, poor people. What was surprising was a number of whites who really came up to him and saying, you're the only person out of there who represent my point of view. Reverend Jackson, in our judgment, helped to enable a new generation of African Americans to serve. Right. This was the civil rights movement deciding that it was time to get involved in electoral politics, and Reverend Jackson was that vehicle for many of us to get involved. America's future, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. The manager of Walter Mondale's campaign called him out and he said, uh, you know, tomorrow night's speech is very important to the Democratic Party. Can you kind of give me an idea of the direction that you're going to go? And he said, tomorrow night you will either be a chimp, a chump, or a champ, but you won't know until tomorrow night. But just because you're born in the slum, does not mean the slum is born in you and you can rise above it. We must leave racial battleground and come to economic common ground and moral higher ground. America, our time has come and come November there will be a change because our time has come. I remember 1988. I just remember Run, Jesse, Run. We were just cheering and chanting and the impact of him of seeing him at the DNC. We had what money could never buy in a campaign. We had passion. Jesse Jackson, you see me on TV, but you don't know the me that makes me me. You talked about not being able to be able to do the stuff folk take for granted. And the young guys who didn't want to talk, didn't want to hear him, they started crying. Because he was able to convince them, I do really understand. You think you got a bad record? Who my, what my name is, where it came from, what my background is. You see? I was born a teenage mother who was born a teenage mother. 
I understand. I know abandonment and people being mean to you and saying you're nothing and nobody and can never be anything. I understand. I understand when nobody knows your name. I understand when you have no name. I understand. And he's talking about it to people who are sitting there thinking, that's me, that's me, that's me. And he's running for president. And he's on the stage. And the message he sent that was more than just subliminal, it was his reality that said, you know what? I can do that. Because he understands what I'm saying. Wherever you are tonight, you can make it. Hold your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. I was trying to carve out a lane of healing, a lane of hope, a lane of reconstruction and revitalization. I wanted to try to uh, pick up the broken pieces and connect them. We're excited to get more people involved in Rainbow Push, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in impacting public policies, if you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, you can become a policymaker by becoming a member of Rainbow Push right now. For an annual membership of $35, or if you're a student or senior, $15, you can help us make a difference in the lives of millions. How do you become a member? Visit our website at rainbowpush.org and press join. Or maybe you'd like to support us. You can text the word PUSH, that's P-U-S-H, to 41444 on your cell phone, and you can give any amount you feel comfortable giving. You can also call us at 773-256-2775, or go to rainbowpush.org and push donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Sonia Whitaker, National Education Policy Director for Push for Excellence. And I want you to know that we are very excited about the outcome of our event, which was held virtually on October the 6th, 2022. And the purpose of the event was to align our work around our critical thinking series, which is entitled Shaping America's Education Agenda. And this month's event in our critical thinking series was focused on the national teacher shortage. In fact, the title was, What About the National Teacher Shortage? A look at this topic through an equity lens. Don't touch that dial. Stay there for just a moment while we provide for you a few highlights from our very successful event, and we look forward to you participating in others. This conversation, what about the national teacher shortage, a look at the topic through an ethnic equity lens, we always have to look through an equity lens. Why is it that black kids are more likely to be dis disciplined than white kids? Why is it that black teachers are less likely to be hired than white teachers? Why is it that we still after, you know, what, so far after Brown, we still see the educational inequities that people talked about in Brown versus Board of Education. I know that you assembled an important group to deal with these issues because these issues must be dealt with. What bothers me the most, Dr. Whitaker, is the passion that people have for some subjects, but not for others. Without getting political, well, you know, that's not possible for me, but you know, you have these people who are basically jumping up and down about abortion, but they're not jumping up and down about kids who are here nor are they jumping up and down about educating young people who are here. We've seen passion in some cities. I want to keep my sports team. You know, I want to keep this. I need people to have that kind of passion for our young people. And with that passion, we must see this whole notion of a teacher shortage. It's really an educational crisis. It's not about the teachers. It's about the system and about the structure. It's about what we need to say time and time again. What are we educating our young people for? 
How are we causing them or teaching them to question predatory capitalism and its outcomes? Now, I know that's a little bit more than the conversation today has, but I would implore every teacher who's watching to think about methodology, pedagogy, what you're teaching, how you're teaching it, and what outcomes you want to have. I love the title of, what about the national teacher shortage? Many people address it from different ways. We're gonna address it from an equity lens. As most narratives suggest, America is suffering from a national teacher shortage. In fact, as many of us know, researchers have found that the national K-12 labor market shrank from about 9% from March to May of 2020. During this Push Excel's critical thinking series, our esteemed panelists are gonna engage in spirited dialogue. Now I won't read all of the objectives, but two or three are important. We're gonna examine the factors that we believe have significantly contributed to the national teacher shortage. We're also going to discuss what we perceive to be as the barriers to preparing, recruiting, and retaining strong, racially diverse teachers. And at the end of the day, our goal is not just to identify and or be perceived as admiring the problem. Our goal is to suggest from our perspectives, policy, and our practical recommendations that should be implemented as soon as yesterday for the purpose of moving our organizations forward. Bottom line, our children are our future. Um, our children deserve a great education and the core to them having a great education is having great teachers um, in front of them. And the fact that we are experiencing a national shortage is a huge problem that we must get to the bottom of. Um, and so I'm passionate about being a part of, of, of this panel uh, to talk about, you know, the different solutions um, so that we can, as a country, move forward. Um, and moving forward isn't from the lens of doing the same things um, and expecting a different result, but truly analyzing the systems and structures that exist um, across our country with how we're doing education, with our teachers' experience, with, with our children, and them having a true great education and what that truly means um, in today. This crisis has also created a new opportunity for us to, over the next few decades, to fill our classrooms with quality uh, educators and quality leaders who will lead those educators. So although there are shortages in some parts of the country, there are some parts of the country that are not experiencing the same type of shortages in, um, uh, as, as some other places, depending on how close they are in urban settings and remote um, uh, locations. But there's an opportunity for us to redefine what education looks like and for us to coordinate across our national um, boundaries to um, give kids more opportunity um, through these technology and the, the use of uh, being in multiple places at once, you know, through these technology. And so I just think this, this, this crisis is, is a unique opportunity. And we can either fill the classrooms with uh, people who are not qualified to teach and further hinder our students' progress, or we can think creatively and innovatively and think about how we, uh, how we contextualize learning in ways that are relevant to our students and that um, puts a premium more on quality instruction and curriculum and, and assessment. Crisis we're seeing uh, has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. I think we've always had an issue with filling very certain positions, math, science positions, right? Uh, I know our rural areas of the country have always, always had a hard time recruiting and retaining good teachers, but I think the pandemic has exacerbated this crisis and now we're seeing this, this trend um, of folks leaving the profession. Um, so for me, this is important uh, because without good teachers, it's hard to have student achievement. Without good teachers, it's hard to have student achievement. And if we don't have student achievement, we're not graduating kids. And if we don't have graduates, um, we don't have a workforce. We don't have a workforce. We don't have community. Without community, then what are we left with? So this conversation is very important and timely, and I'm excited to, to share some solutions and best practices and address what I think are some of, of, some of the uh, systemic barriers um, that exist that have prevented us from really um, allowing our teachers to thrive. Just to back up a little bit, just to put it into perspective, and I have you, there was a mention, uh, Devin mentioned the, the pandemic. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a tweet and I said, if our schools look the same on the backside of this pandemic as they did when we started, then we have failed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it ties in with the, the national teacher shortage. Unfortunately, the pandemic did a lot to dismantle 
and cause public education to come under attack like it has never come under attack before. And I think a lot of our teachers who are seasoned teachers um, chose to go into other, other, other roles. They chose to go work for private companies. They chose to do other things. And I think a big piece of that has to do not with the culture and climate of our school districts, but with the non nonstop attack of public education. So I think one of the biggest things that we need to discuss as a, as a group tonight and in our, in our districts is how do we stop the all out attacks on public education uh, in America? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll say that's where, where my passion for this comes in uh, is coming up with how do we build, uh, to, to Dr. Nelm's point, how do we build the next generation of teachers um, that, that, that are collaborative, that are um, problem solvers, and that break the mold that we see in all the movies where it's the one teacher up against the entire world. That is not what we want to see our teachers do. We want to see them collaborate, engage with one another, and, and engage in collective teacher efficacy. And I think by doing those two things, uplifting public education, uplifting the profession, and ensuring that teachers don't go at it alone, uh, are three key things that I would love to see us uh, have some more conversation about tonight. I just wanted to pull together some of kind of the big ideas. And one is this idea that really our schools are the backbones of our communities. They are the epicenter of what happens. Yeah. People move into a place because they want their child in that particular school. It becomes um, like tonight, I have three events at schools because our community is there. It's, it's the, the fire department was there. I mean, it just, that's who we are. We bring together communities. And so I think where we are right now is that this shortage didn't just randomly happen. This has been going on for decades. And part of it goes back to what Dr. Sanders alluded to, which is that we are now in a space that we're being forced to have a conversation about the value of our profession. Yeah. Because we've allowed other people to determine the value and the nature of what we do as educators. And we've just sat back and said, oh, that's not the way it should be. Well, right now we're forced that now the rubber has really hit the road. We now have to have this conversation about the value and we have to define what education looks like, what educators look like, what the value is of what we do, how it impacts your whole community, how it impacts not just the children in front of us, but the generations to come. And so I think our conversation tonight is geared towards that. And at the same time, what are the solutions to move us? Because we can't stay in this conversation. Our kids don't have the luxury of us as adults with all the degrees that we have sitting around this screen. They don't have the luxury to wait for us to try to figure it out. We have to get on top of it now. And I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Wilson to weigh in on for a second, but I wanna pivot for just a second because uh, one of the things that you said, uh, Ms. White, was about uh, support and resources. And I'm going back to the second part of our title is looking at this through an equity lens. I must admit, as I, you know, for quite some time, even prior to COVID, I was very aware of the teacher shortage. I must admit, I don't know that I realized initially how different that looks in an affluent school district versus a school district like the ones Dr. Leek and I lead where a greater majority of the students are fabulously minority, right? Uh, that's a positive, not a negative. But with that being said, for example, you know, you'll have, we'll have an inner city school district, a smaller one maybe, with uh, 10, 12, 14 schools, but missing 40 staff that like literally I have been able to see need 40 teachers. Whereas right up the street and around the corner, a school district may have 27 or 32 schools or 150 schools and, and maybe they're serving majority of fluent students and they may be missing a couple hundred, maybe. Why, why do you think that is the case? One of the issues we have we, we focus on special education students who've been designated as having some developmental disorders or developmental needs. However, in uh, some of your poor school districts, particularly after COVID or during COVID, you have a number of students who are not 
developmentally delayed according to a test, but they have some issues at home that require social work, that require um, some supports that do not happen to be available on a daily basis in schools that uh, support children uh, with low income parents. And so I'm wondering, this teacher shortage might be, for example, I taught chemistry and I had a student in my class that had a, a disability. I, I'm not trained to deal with students with special needs. And so I'm teaching a science which has some dangers associated with it. No one prepared me as a young teacher for that one student in the class. I didn't have a social worker. I didn't have a counselor. He didn't have a person with him every day. And so I think a lot of teachers would just say, I, I can't do this. I can't teach the subject matter and at the same time deal with some of these social emotional concerns, students who live in war-torn communities. I don't have the time or the capacity to deal with those needs and teach a subject. And in most of our school districts, whether it's in inner city Chicago, inner city New York, Harvey, Dixmore, you don't have a social worker on staff every day sitting in that building, a nurse where you can send the students. You don't have that. In affluent districts, you do. So how does, how does uh, that play into the teacher shortage, do you think? I, I appreciate that. Uh, do you want to, want to add value to that? And I uh, also have a follow-up question along those same lines, if, if not. What, what would you identify from, and I know we have uh, you here, our panelists working on multiple levels of the system. What um, have you found to be some of the hardest positions to fill within your respective organizations? I think we can all, well, at least for me, um, my experience as a school board member and um, my experience looking at it from a national lens, it's of course, it's already been mentioned here, math, science, uh, even special education are hard to fill positions. Um, you know, so bilingual positions are extremely hard to fill. Now it, it gets worse when you try to ensure that you're bringing in diverse staff. So, which is another component to uh, recruitment. It's, it's one thing to find staff, but ensuring that they actually reflect the demographics of the community is another layer, a challenge really, um, that I think needs to be addressed as well. And a lot of this starts with leadership. Um, we know that local schools are governed locally by governing boards. Mm -hmm. And the fact is the majority of governing boards don't reflect the communities they serve. Typically, they're 60 plus older white male. These are folks that are voting on policies, setting a vision, mission, initiative, uh, salaries, holding superintendents accountable. Oftentimes, if you don't have representation at that level, it's very rare that you're going to have rep representation trickle down into the system. Um, that's just what I've seen through my lens. And so I just wanted to bring attention to that, is that oftentimes it's the leadership that sits on top that can either move forward with some of these initiatives to recruit and attract and attain a diverse workforce or not. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to point that out. I want now to elevate the conversation toward, we, I've heard you, many of you given solid examples. And I love the fact that a lot of the examples are being implemented um, at the practical level, like hands-on. Can we talk a little bit more about what policy recommendations you have relevant to this? You know, very, and I think that Representative Devin, your point about, um, Politics and education. Politics plays an impact on whether or not we're able to close the gap as it relates to hiring and retaining teachers. And so what we're again is suggesting is that not only does policy need to be developed, but we also have to possess the political will to act upon what we know. In fact, William Bracey says, we know where the problems lie. We know where the resources are needed. The question is, do we possess the political will to act upon what we know? And with that being said, I do want to move toward um, some policy recommendations or things you think that policymakers, if you're not doing it already, should consider to drive home our point uh, even more clearly. I'm going to say something that might be unpopular. <laughs> 
that's Perfect. that's okay. Yeah. You know, districts across this country have received millions and millions of dollars in the last two years. And some use it very strategically to do the work that's required, while others do not. We would be foolish to think that people aren't watching and waiting to prove that when you give school districts money, they mm. themselves don't know how to spend it. On the back end of this will be less funding for schools. So from a policy standpoint, we have to think about what are the, the interventions that we've used, depending on the state interventions or local interventions that must be sustained and to advocate for funding for those things, while also being very honest with ourselves and saying, for those expenditures that we, we use to do things that perhaps did not address um, the intent of those funds, you know, who bears responsibility for that? I, I truly believe that the political nature of education is gonna get worse because we were given ample funding. And there are folks who will say that schools aren't able or willing or prepared to handle the funding that's given. Therefore, we're going to put it into privatization of schools. That's my prediction. It might not be a popular, uh, popular opinion, but I think it's the perfect setup um, for us after this crisis. So we have to think about how to galvanize local support to maintain the interventions that we know will support black and brown um, youth most. Donna? Wow. I just wanted to add, Sean, you are so right. So from my seat at the state level, what I have been consistent about is money without the monitoring means nothing. So one of the big issues that we've been dealing with in Illinois in particular is how is the money being spent? And every single time, my question is, show me the equity, show me the breakdown. Don't just, don't just give me numbers. I want to know how many African-American teachers were in this, how many Hispanic, how many, so if you've got a, a grant to servicing community schools, where are those schools? They can't all be in Chicago. And I, I love Chicago, but we have a whole state of 852 districts. So we have been very de demanding, I, I will just say it as a state board, in terms of the monitoring connected to equity pieces. We have a whole contingency in our, um, in our strategic plan that is all about equity. So if we're saying this is what we're about and we don't monitor it, then we're not doing our job. And, and then the other part for me too is, don't just, don't just tell me where the money is, don't just give me the data, but now I wanna see, did it work? So what did it look like ahead of time? What does it look like now? Which students have been impacted? How many African-American, we're just starting a whole program to support African-American teacher pipeline at the, in our state schools right now. Like we were putting a whole bunch of money behind it. At the end of the day, I'm gonna to need to know how did, how did we monitor? What does it look like? How are those students impacted? I would know the pass rates. Tell me the pass rates for African-American Hispanic teachers. On, I need to know that they're passing the test and in classrooms and that they're being successful there. So this, again, the money without monitoring, it doesn't mean anything. And that monitoring has to be at every single level. And sometimes I know we make decisions at the state level that our local districts don't like. Well, part of it is because I'm sitting at the table and I'm apologizing now, Tony, I'm sorry. But I'm at the table and I'm saying, this isn't good enough. I need more data. So whatever you have to do in the system to capture that data so that we can make sure that the way the monies are being used is appropriate, then that's what we're going to do. Um, like right now we have our evidence-based funding that requires you to show how you spent the money in an equitable way. Well, I know it's not people's favorite, but at the end of the day, it's how we can monitor what's happening with the funds that we're putting aside. We've done some changes in licensure. The other piece too that I wanted to add to that we've done at the state level is we're providing the high impact tutoring, which is at no cost to district. And it's one to three ratio that the state is paying for. And we are intentionally getting it into those districts that we know that the young people need it the most. The other piece too, that we've been talking about the pipeline, but I also wanna talk about how do we keep teachers in our profession? So yeah. we started a whole mentoring program, the state did, that connects if you're an African-American kindergarten teacher, 
and you're in, let's say you're in Southern Illinois and there's no other African-American kindergarten teachers down that way, but there's somebody uh, in, in Macomb, we'll partner, partner them for you to have a mentor who looks like you, teaches to try and make sure that we're keeping you in the pipeline. So we've got to develop the pipeline, get you in it, keep you in the pipeline, and then we have to monitor and stay on top of it. That okay. we have, I mean, that's, I think that's the will sometimes that we don't necessarily put at the forefront is the will to do the monitoring and to stay the course. Thank you. Okay. And, can I, and then Reverend Jeanette, and then I want to pull from something you just said as, uh, as we pivot to closing. Uh, Dr. Reverend Jeanette, you want to add value? Well, what I wanted to say is education, as you know, is a state right, not a federal guaranteed protected right. So every school district, every state has different rules and guidelines for what you have to provide in terms of education. We need to move it to be a national right for every child to have a high quality education. And there's some tenants that have should be uh, for high schools in particular. Every child will not go to college. Every child should be prepared for a career or college. And I think that we have to, uh, in professional development, we should have guidelines for teachers Perfect. so that they can teach not just to the test, but teach to the career. And so uh, partnerships with universities, but also partnerships with corporate America would be helpful as you look at framing teacher development. Public, yeah, professional development. Professional development. That's where I wanted to pivot to next because we've talked a little bit about that, but I think that we would be remiss if we didn't recognize that in our country, our schools are indeed becoming majority minority. And the reality is that in our country, majority of the teachers that are teaching our students are white. And I have to add, because I've interacted with a, light, a lot of white teachers, I need to give them kudos because some of them say, Doc, it ticks me off when you say that. Does that mean I'm not a good teacher? No, it doesn't mean that you're not a good teacher. So um, what we are recognizing, however, as we said, is that representation matters. And so this kind of moves me to our, our final recommendation in the form of policy. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to make a comment and then ask if you've implemented any policies in particular related to requirements for teachers and administrators to have training relevant to the implementation of culturally responsive pedagogy or culturally responsive teaching in your respective organization. Would anybody like to respond to what you're doing? I'll, I'll give you, if you wanna do a minute apiece or a minute for whoever's interested, um, if you're doing it and or if you have a policy attached to it. And I also think I would be remiss in this district where I serve as deputy superintendent of schools if I didn't say that we do have a policy attached to the need for or the requirement that within a year of hire, all teachers and or administrators will have training relevant to culturally responsive teaching. Uh, was it uh, Representative Devin who wanted to add or, or Dr. Nels who wanted to, to add to that? Dr. Nels? Yeah, so I, I would say um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. Um, not only policy, but practice. So I think the intersection between policy, practice, and beliefs, they have to be in work, they have to work in concert. So I put in the chat um, a website that we, we created that allows for districts outside of ours to, to get a, a start on looking at what a culturally relevant, sustaining pedag pedagogical practice or structure may look like. Um, because what we get a lot in our community is we don't have diversity in our schools. That's a horrible starting point because you do. <laughs> um, and, and then and then we say, well, they say, well, where do we begin? And that's where like these sample units help and some of the consulting work that we do at the university. I would go one step further and say that this goes beyond just training, having a culturally relevant, sustaining training. It has to be embedded in the curriculum. And, I, and I'll say this all the time. The curriculum is our moral contract with our school community. If it's not in the curriculum, it won't happen. I don't care how much, how many restorative circles you do and how people will commit to diversity and inclusion. If it's not being taught every day as part of their intentional planning, their intentional assessment, then it won't get done systemically and it won't be sustained. And so I would challenge us all and those listening um, is to go back and revisit your curriculum mm -hmm. and have teachers be co-constructors in those in that curricula to a point where it becomes part of their, their normal pedagogical pedagogy and, and no, part of their normal practice. So I just want to say that. Ms. White, thank you. 
And can I just agree with that? I, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. I would take it a, even a step further and say, um, and so first of all, in U46, we do have an equity policy that requires us to, to ensure staff members are, uh, are trained in a culturally responsive teaching methods. Um, uh, and so we, we do endeavor to do that work. Uh, I would say though, that we also have to adjust our assessment and accountability systems to ensure that they're also culturally and linguistically appropriate for mm -hmm. our students. So um, I think uh, Dr. Leake, you talked about the state report card and you know the impact that an exceptional school has over a commendable versus one that's a targeted assistant school. Um, and unfortunately the targeted assistant schools, um, you know, 35% of my students are still English language learners. They have not mastered the language of English and yet they have to test every year on a test that is a nationally norm 50%, you know, at the 50th percentile where we expect 100% of the kids to get it right in English only. That is not linguistically appropriate. And we know that our tests are not, are, are not culturally appropriate as well. So uh, the CRT word that I know everybody gets upset about in some circles is, uh, is not critical race theory. It's, it's critical, it's, it's a culturally responsive teaching. And that's what we want to see across all of our school districts, absolutely. That was awesome, thank you. Could I, could I just add, I know we're getting close to closing this out, no, but I, I think I, I'd be remiss if I don't point out that we have to break the cycle in, in Hollywood and, and anybody that propagates the white savior syndrome in TV and in the media, um, you know, and I hate to call it specific examples, but every teaching movie, every teaching TV show predominantly is showing oh, is a white savior syndrome movie, Freedom Riders, right? Students weren't the successful ones. It was the teacher, the, the one white teacher that steps in to save the students, right? Um, and we need TV and, and movies that, that actually reflect what happens in classrooms where teachers collaborate with one another. And it really represents what, what happens day in and day out in classrooms, not what you see in, in the media. And I think that would actually help this conversation around how do we attract and retain teachers? Because all they see on TV are the ones that ended up being divorced and the one person trying to take on an entire system. And that's just not, that's not what it is, so. Absolutely, Miss Misha, I'm gonna do something I've never done before. You wanna give closing remarks with me? <laughs> sure. Okay. Do you have any final remarks regarding uh, this experience we've had together today? Yeah, this experience um, has been amazing just to hear the amazing things happen around the country, the innovation, um, the creativity, the heart and passion of, of wonderful people who are in great positions um, that can influence community. So kudos to each of you um, and the amazing work that you are doing and, um, you know, forward thinking and planning about, you know, our current realities, I would like to, you know, encourage young people to pursue um, and major in urban education. Um, and for our state and for our state and 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 thinking about policy to encourage and and incentivize people to ma uh, major in urban education. Um, again, this has been a great, great, great panel, great discussion, and I appreciate uh, this opportunity. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll, I'll say ditto and thank you for our distinguished panelists. We actually spent, I'm sure Reverend Dr. Jeanette can attest to this, we actually spent a little more time with recommendations uh, than we normally do. That is a pivot that we are trying to do at Push Excel to make sure that those who uh, are part of our panelists can continue to contribute relevant to growing uh, the thinking of those that are participating and watching live. So I'm happy to say that uh, not too long after this event, we will make this entire recording available on the Push Excel website. Push Excel's goal is to inspire students to strive for excellence in education in spite of personal, family, and community challenges that they might experience. How do we do this? By advocating for educational policies that guarantee equal funding for all students without regard to race or economic standing.
by engaging parents, students, and teachers in pursuing high quality education and striving for educational excellence at every level, and by forging partnerships with community-based and public sector stakeholders in education. Now, Push Excel is a national model program with the purpose of connecting principals, parents, popular personalities, and students in a bond and to support students at every level on the educational ladder. Now, we want you to become a member of the Rainbow Push Coalition and Push Excel. Your annual membership can help us to change policies that impact students, colleges, and universities all around the country. So step up and sign up today. Membership is only $35, and if you're a student or a senior, $15. Just go to our website, rainbowpush.org, and push join to become a member or push donate to support the Push Excel program. You can also text the word Push Excel, that's P-U-S-H-E-X-C-E-L, to 41444 on your cell phone, and you can give us any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us at 773-256-2775. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. And remember to keep hope alive. When I think of Rainbow Push, I think of two words, social justice, education advocacy, political empowerment, freedom and equality, corporate partnership. Stop the violence, save the children. Don't get in, shut it down. If we don't get in, shut it down. Political change, inclusion, evolution, progress, justice. Jesse Jackson. Keep hope, keep hope, alive. alive. Keep hope, keep, keep hope, hope. alive. Thank you.